Right, what we're talking about today, uh, evaluation. So uh, what is evaluation? So evaluation is basically just evaluating a quoted expression in the custom environment. That also makes it a non-standard um, a uh, non-standard uh, evaluation because typical evaluation is done in the same environment in which it's created. Um, and particularly we're gonna go over tidy evaluation that you can do certain aspects of this in base, I believe, but I find that that just actually complicates things rather than actually makes it particularly clear. But we'll see how much of that is actually lit in the um, in the presentation going forward. Um, our Lang is also loaded up with Tidyverse, so you don't actually tend to have to load it in independently, but people do. But that's more just for uh, demonstration purposes, I believe. Okay. So uh, what's basics? Uh, basics are that uh, what makes a tidy evaluation so important is that quite often when we load something in, um, it is evaluated pretty much straight away. Um, but you don't always have to do that. And it's useful not to as well, because quite often you want a buffer between, um, between your evaluation and uh, between loading something in, as you might have some intermediary um, uh, calculations to do or something like that uh, so maybe even just uh, manipulating data frames but you might want to do that within a function you might want to do it inside a package and this is particularly important for packages um, so in this particular case uh, what you see is a uh, expression that is created so I believe this is in the book so x equals 10 and then that is cr created into an expression which is basically just one part of an abstract, abstract syntax tree or well, the elements of the ab abstract syntax tree. And then if you put eval in, it just gets evaluated straight, straight away. But the expression itself is separate from the evaluation. So if you go down below, then you can do that um, and also specify an environment as well to work it in. Uh, and you can say what's inside that in a particular environment, which is, can be quite useful. So you can control environments and information within them. Um, so in this particular example here, um, the first uh, example, the first aspect is uh, evaluated straight away. And the second part is just, uh, is not evaluated. So we can see that X is evaluated from the previous example, but not from the environment that's uh, there. In order to do that, you need to um, select. Um, you need to select expression rather than print, because it needs to be evaluated afterwards. So, in the first part, X is being taken from the global environment as opposed to from the environment in which the uh, expression has been generated. So um, here's an application that um, so. One of the applications is that uh, you can use local in order to create a uh, multi-step computation and you can de and uh, you can then do that express do that calculation in that particular environment instead of having it done str straight away in, within the global environment which can help you to avoid um, interactions between different bits of code and um, this bits from uh, base are uh, but it basically allows you to carry out a series of steps. And this is just one of the examples in which it can be useful. I'm sure you can use local for a lot more complex things than that. Uh, but this is just a contrived example of that. Um, so if we wanted to do that using tidy instead or using the eval, uh, what we can do is we can create a function, we'll create a function with a normal functional wrapper. And then we create, a we create an environment by selecting the calling environment and call that N, uh, env. And then we then create this, an ex, this enriched expression, which picks out the expression from the function. So in uh, the local two example here, our enriched expression is, um, is x plus y. And that gives us foo, which is, um, does anyone know why? Um, well, I mean, when you evaluate it, you're saying, why does it, why is it 210? 
Yeah. Well, sorry. Oh, no. I, sorry, I got that wrong. I was thinking about uh, something that comes later on, actually. Yeah, because um, I was like, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, that, that is straightforward. I, I got that mixed up with the when you use expression instead of enriching expression, um, which, as you know, will give you the developer bit. <laughs> Okay, so that brings us to quotients because that's, uh, that's a key part of this, isn't it? Um, so uh, what are they? The basically a version of, um, well, actually originally in, um, in they're originally inspired by, um, by the models, uh, like linear models, if you think about it. So the functions are created. When you're creating a model, it takes, uh, the expression and it also creates an environment with that expression and then you can evaluate that expression within that and that's why originally tidy a lot of the tidy eval actually uses um was using the uh tilde um the tilde uh, symbol as opposed to using um some of the stuff that they use now instead um because it's just inspired by well create a function of this with these expressions instead. And I think they still do have it in parts somewhere. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. But essentially the whole idea of create, of an expression with a capturing environment is comes from uh, you know, typical modeling. So when you use a uh, LM and create an expression that will capture the expression and create an environment where it holds all the information. Uh, so that's what a quotient is. It's a composite structure of an expression environment. Or you can think of it as like a linear model if you want. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, how do you make them? So Arlang creates them in three ways. So you can uh, use enquo or enquos. So enquos is when you have mul when you're uh, using multiple arguments as opposed to just one argument. Um, and this that's the most common way to do it. And you'll, you can see that throughout um, a lot of the other packages that are being created. And then you can also use uh, quo and you can use quotes, uh, which basically just match expression and expressions. Uh, although it says you probably shouldn't do this. I can't remember why uh, off the top of my head. If anyone knows, let me know. And also you can just create new, uh, new quotient if you really want to. Uh, which uh, Hadley, which it says here, and Hadley says in the book, is useful for learning, but you know, probably don't need to do this. Um, so, um, so here's my example. I stole this from Matt Denko, uh, uh, Business Science, and um, I highly recommend uh, looking at some of his videos online because they are amazingly good. Um, anyway, he created the uh, anomalize package, which is something that I use on a daily basis and have put into a bit into some of the stuff that I use for um, doing modeling. Um, basically, if you don't know what that is, uh, anomalizes is, uh, takes time series structures and it creates a way of um, flagging um, items that appear to be outside of what would be normal in a uh, time series structure. So that would be something like what we just call an outlier, really, in normal in normal data speak. But it's really important in time series because time series is just a ball ache. <laughs> anyway, right. So in this example here, this is a bit of code from the from the anomalized package that uses. And what you have here is um, in this section, you've got um, anomalized, and it's been given, and this is how it responds to. So anomalize here is the generic, and then you've got this uh, uh, specific here for um, the Tibble data frame. And basically, these are the elements that should be going into it, uh, which it checks for. Um, but there's this, uh, this argument here, which is called target. Now, target is specified later on down here, and this is used to uh, quote and capture the environment. So, so basically capturing all the information that's going into here. So, and then this is then pulled into, um, this is then pulled in later on in order to uh, pull the target uh, column as it were, and then analyze that for anomaly detection. 
uh, and but it's, it's quoted here. So this is the most common structure that you'll see with this. Which, so typically speaking, in most of the examples, in most ways it's used, you see end quote and it's passed on to some object within a function. And then that is then later unquoted um, uh, at the point which is needed. Oh, it went a bit further. Now, if you want to do it with multiple arguments, um, you then have to use end quotes. So if you were passing in, say, a, a list or um, a, a, list of fun a list of arguments, you then need to use end quotes instead. And you can see below in this example, when you're pulling out the, um, when you're pulling out the information about it, um, what you end up with is a list of the, the listed expression and it's picked up the global environment in that particular case. Okay, so um, so you can also create quotas with quo and new quo. Uh, so using quo is just simple. You just put out the beginning and it's you just put in your um, your expressions and it just captures those and it seems to be most put into the global environment instead. Whereas new quotas, you tend to have to express your own environment. And this is better to some extent than using uh, using Quo by itself because you've got more control over the elements in the environment that's being uh, selected upon by the expression. Okay, um, so going to the next section. Um, so in this particular case, we're creating a new quotient entirely. Um, we're using the new quotient argument and you're just putting the expression into that. And that is a class of quotient and formula instead. Whereas the other one was, what was it? Uh, the other one was just an environment. Yeah, sorry, the other one was just an expression. The last two here, if you see their expressions and their environments global expression and the, uh, the environment that was specified sorry, the, the calling environment, I presume that is when it's creating new closure. In this case, it doesn't actually say what the, uh, what the um, calling environment is because it's creating a closure by itself and just pulling in what is considered to be a formula. Strange how it does that differently. Anyway, um, so that is considered to be a call object instead of be, of um, so it's not quite the same as the other ones, and it, yeah, if you do use it, dot environment. Have a dot environment. I think all closures are call environment or call objects. It's a are they super class? Yeah, that new closure is just using like on the previous page. It's just using the global environment implicitly, like where it does where it's quo. Yeah. Yeah, it's just using the global environment as the default for the environment instead of specifying one. Or it, it not necessarily global, just whatever the calling environment is, is what it's using. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry. So, with Quo, it just uses global environment, but with New Quo, it just uses whatever environment it's specified. It just uses a calling environment. Yeah. If it, well, it's using the calling environment as well so it's like it probably has like in equals caller environment or you can specify an environment um, and so if you don't specify an environment these are getting called in the global environment so it's just going to take the global environment as the environment to evaluate the expression in. okay yeah at least that's that's what i took out of that all right, cool. Um, yeah, there it is. Actually, when you when you look at the attribute, mm -hmm. uh, you can see it. Should, it just took the global environment, which is where it was called in. Oh, I see. Sorry, I get that now. Yeah, it makes more sense when you put it that way. So basically, you're just getting a lot more control over the environments, but it is typically just defaulted to uh, to global. Okay. Um, so. Um, there are three main forms of non-standard uh, evaluation, uh, in tidy evaluation anyway. Um, so we've got quasi-quotation, which um, Stephen talked about a couple of weeks ago. 
um, uh, quotas and data masks. Um, so basically tidy evaluation takes two, um, two arguments as a quota and a data mask. Um, now, uh, oh, I've got a bit on data masks here. What is, it? What is a data mask? So a data mask, essentially a mask is a, a data frame or a list that's, that essentially when you try to run code, uh, that's where it is starting to look for variables first. And so it supersedes the actual environment in terms of a variable lookup. So think of it, um, if you can, as uh, like this is the environment that goes before the, actual, before the current environment if that makes sense. So instead of going for the environment in which you're acting in, it kind of supersedes that environment, if that makes it any sense at all to you. <laughs> um, so what we could do is we could create a uh, closure using a new environment, and then we can pass in a, a data frame that says um, Y uh, of one of five, and then in tidy eval we can pass it uh, pass in the closure expression and in a data frame or uh, or some other data parameter. And so our expression is uh, then going to be taken from, from those elements. Um, so to use this current example instead, um, so let's just go to the closure example. You know, creating it, we're basically taking here is a data frame, which is the Palm Penguins example. And we're creating a quotient of that, but it also uh, has, so it's got the mass of the body, uh, well, maximum body mass. And we're um, using NARM, so that's just to remove, uh, remove uh, any NAAs. Um, now, that's not actually going to be evaluated until we pass it to tidy eval. So when we pass this expression and the quotient to tidy eval, it is then evaluated at that particular moment in time. And the data mask uh, is uh, basic. It's usually, you can think of it as a data frame, to be honest. Um, it's, and like, like I say, it's the first place to look up for, uh, for variables. Um, so in this example here, um, they're trying to replicate with, and is this from the book as well? Um, so how this works, um, uh, so we've got library, uh, again, we're selecting palm penguins and we use, and the with function basically um, goes over that data frame and uh, then uses uh, the expression, which is uh, the body mass and does exactly what we did before. But when we create the, our new version of with, um, we're using the expression term here. So we put in our data and we, uh, we uh, use an enriched in quote, uh, quotient to capture that expression with the data. And then that, or the, it's contextualized by that rather. And then the tidy evaluation then uh, evaluates that with whatever data frame we've put in there. And that, so when we then do the same thing below here, it literally does the same thing. Apart from we, instead of using this old version of doing it, what we've done is we've done it through tidy evaluation instead. And so that allows us to, that allows them in the tidyverse to basically update some of the older methods, which can make it more useful for uh, passing it into other uh, dplyr verbs. Um, oh, I thought I removed this, but you can see again, it's the same, it's the same kind of thing. Um, so again, we're creating a function and we're capturing uh, an element of that with uh, the enriched uh, quotient. And we've stored that object as uh, rows. And then rows isn't evaluated until we put it into tidy evaluation, which, uh, which also contextualizes that in the, in the frame of the data set that's thrown in there. Um, so the, one of the problems with data masks is that, um, that it provides uh, some aspect of ambiguity. Uh, so the data mask provides us with two pronouns, um, which is dot data and dot environment. Um, and dot data always refers to um, whatever is in, 
the so if you're doing this here uh, in order to create get hold of a uh, variable it refers to the x inside the data mask um, whereas if we use the dot n uh, environment it, al it allows us to select the x which is inside the environment instead so that gives us two very different kind of results so in this particular case we've got x equals ones and a data frame which has uh, x equals two. So that's our df. So we've got df versus x. So when we use with two, um, the, and we would put in our data frame, if we use dot x as the environment, it will select the information from the, um, it will select the information from the data mask. So the data mask is in this particular case, df. And that's why it selects as two. But if we don't do that, we use dot n, then we, use, well, then we get the uh, whatever is in the environment. I've, uh, sorry, got a bit of a bug. <clears throat> if that, so presumably that's very useful when you are uh, making, when you're writing a package or doing something in Shiny. Uh, it probably is quite useful when you're actually writing your own functions, to be honest. I haven't used it an awful lot myself. Um, but, um, but it can help you to translate data from what is within the function to what is outside it. Um, um, what's this? Uh, there's no reason to shrub, but it does and can be used to, yeah. Why does that work? Uh, dot data and dot env are actually exported from our lang. Um, so these are, but these are basically, you know how they use bang, 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 or bang bang. Um, basically, they've all they've created them within our lang instead. So um, it's already set up for data to retrieve data variables from data frame, whereas the env is for the environment. They're not real data, um, and this is the key. The other key part: they're not real data frames. They just act like them sometimes. So um, if you, you can't take do names dot data frame or map over it. Mm. All right, okay. Um, so when is tidy evaluation actually beneficial? And I, I watched talk about this the other day and the general argument is that it's not useful all the time when you're using dplyr verbs, but it's okay that it can be useful in uh, when you're actually programming your own stuff. Um, so, What's this practical example here? Sorry, I didn't get this far when I was uh, going over. Uh, for example, Alex. Hmm. Oh yeah, so <clears throat> over here, cond, I believe, doesn't work because it's not uh, referenced properly. So because I think it might be evaluated first. Um, so subsample doesn't quote any arguments. So yeah, there you go. So cond is uh, evaluated normally and not in the data mask in a data mask. And then we get an area when it tries to find the binding for x, and as a consequence, that's why you end up with this incorrect data frame instead of what you expected. Whereas if you then enquo it, so this brings us back to what we talked about before. If you do enquo and then you come down here and you do bang, bang, uh, when you do it, it works properly and it does uh, act as sub as sample. So uh, I believe that in one of the talks which they gave uh, our studio last year or was a couple of years ago, they basically say, if you uh, take one thing away, what you really want to do is take away the fact that you should do that this is a common way of uh, trying of pushing uh, an expression further down into the tube which is you do your rich closure and then you bang bang it to pull it out or you can do uh, bang 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 if uh, you've got a dots argument or dot 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 if you want to call it. Um, so, um, same kind of threshold. All 
Oh, yeah. So this is the other thing, isn't it? Which is, um, how does it handle ambiguity? Um, so if we consider the function is meant to find all the rows in, uh, in the data frame where X is at least the same threshold as a value. How can it go wrong in this particular case? If val, if val exists inside the data frame itself, um, if X is in the calling environment, but not in DF. So basically it's saying is, if, there's a, if there's ambiguity because of the naming, I believe the naming conventions. Um, so you could do a better version of that by using the, uh, by the using data mask here. So here we're saying specify value from the environment as opposed to, and here from the actual data provided in. So that's how you avoid your ambiguity by using these data masks here. Um, and then it works a lot better, essentially. Um, so this then goes on about, I think this is all about base R. Um, I'm not sure how useful it is to discuss base R. Um, because I think it becomes very confusing and adds additional <laughs> unnecessary complexity to something that I already find particularly challenging. Um, Agreed. Yeah. So I would say stick to tidy eval and just ignore base R, uh, base R's version. And that's not to say anything against the people who built base R because they did an incredible job building it. But at the same time, it's just like doing meta programming itself is a bit of a pain. And when you start throwing in things like um, substitute, which doesn't make any logical sense to me at all, um, it starts to become a bit too complicated. Does, is anyone bothered about base R? No, but I will say that match call uh, is kind of useful in that it does something that, as far as I know, Arlang does not do. Do you want to, um, can you explain that, Stephen? Yeah, so match call, if you are inside of a function, yeah, so it's showing you there, if you call match call from inside of a function, it'll give you the actual call of the function that called it. So like, you can see it right there. So it's useful for like, you can get how the function was actual call, actually called, and you can pull stuff out of it. And so one of the ways in which I found it to be useful is you can take like match call and you can take another function that is um, formal args, like FML args, formal args. And that will give you the function as it is called with its defaults, like as you wrote the function and when you originally wrote it. And you can take like, the values that the person specified when they called the function and you can combine those uh, with varying like default values um, and evaluate them using like tidy eval. That's like the one place where I found it to be useful. So it does something that's like outside of the Arlang set, at least as far as I know, there's no equivalent to match call. And so it's useful for that. That's pretty cool. Um, I hadn't really thought about that too much. What I did find is that I thought that the, uh, the base R stuff just seemed to add uh, additional detail on top of doing the same thing. I think that's perhaps a mistake of the book, to be honest. But when you, when you say that the match call actually does something that's quite different, actually, that does make sense to learn it a bit more. Um, I'm not sure how much further he goes down into this. Uh, he does use an example of match call. Um, so uh, steps in using match call, capture complete call, modify it, evaluate results. Um, so let's see, what does he do? Um, so match call, write table, expand dots. And then he quotes the, uh, the written table. Oh, so he's, he's copying, um, sorry, he's copying the, uh, what's it? Uh, .csv, isn't he? Sorry. 
yeah, not really something uh, to particularly follow. Um, so, as we discussed before, um, as possible wrap up as before. Oh, you can use sometimes you can use um, the function button instead. Sorry, function tilde instead. I'm not sure it's a good thing to particularly learn. Um, anyway, I do think this is going down into base R. Um, anyway, um, he's made some notes at the end here, which are quite useful. Um, so, uh, enriched in expression uh, basically captures uh, the calling, uh, uh, the caller environment uh, using call end, but it doesn't tell us that it does it. Um, but it do that's what it does do. And uh, I believe that's what we talked about before, actually. Uh, generates, um, and then we typically speaking want to generate a new expression using um, using just expression, or, well, x par, and then unquoting it, which is essentially the same pattern that we're seeing throughout with when you see the rich expression. But when we're using expression, we're just pulling out the actual, um, I suppose, the fundamentals of it. Um, and then evaluate that expression, and then the evaluation of it is done in the uh, in the calling environment. Um, so his example here is um, door length in millimeters. <laughs> Why? Um, so this is whatever this is our object that we're going to do, and then we uh, so we're creating our different expressions. And then they're put into, oh, I see we're copying linear model, are we? All right. Um, and then we're unquoting that. So that's how you do. So this is, ne isn't this nested uh, nested closure? Or some, I think this is nested closures, which it goes on about in the book. Um, uh, so, and then another, another thing that Daryl mentions here is, uh, so the problem, what if you want a function that resamples before training the model? Um, something that doesn't work is to use the typical style here, uh, which the enriched expression, and then uh, then do the bang bang. Um, as uh, the LM call and the resample are in different environments, I presume you uh, the what you should use here is the um, what's it called the data mask. I not entirely sure what's going on here. Um, I think I'm gonna have to call it, to be honest. I don't really know um, know enough to be comfortable explaining what's going on in this particular part. Um, so essentially tidy, value, tidy valuation just allows us to do, uh, to do, I suppose you work with promises is, is probably the best way to put it. Um, and the main way to do that for most people is to use the end quote function or end quotes function. And then with those, we, uh, we use the bang bang uh, operator, I suppose you might call it that. And that's thrown into, um, and that's thrown into an awful lot of the new packages you see or anything that's certainly in the tidyverse. Um, yeah. Uh, so that I would say is it. Does anyone have any questions or anything that they'd like to discuss about this? Um, Thank you. Sorry, um, I'm not as well prepared for this as I should be. No worries, it was good. Can you go to that uh, weird thing towards the end? Yeah, that thing. This is from the book, actually. I think. So in the book, it says, um, if you want to mingle objects supplied by the user with objects that you create in a function, uh, for example, imagine you want to create a automatic resample version, version of a linear model. Uh, you might write it like this, which is exactly how it's written there. 
or pretty much how it's written there. Oh. Um, so he's got the dollar call sign afterwards. Not really sure why. Well, oh. I remember the motivation was something like if you go on the previous slide, I think, or maybe the previous two. It just says like formula equals formula somewhere on one of these. So they were trying to get it so that you could actually see the, yeah, this. Mm. It just says formula equals formula. So I think they were trying to get it so you could actually see the like variable names. Mm. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah. That call doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> no, it yeah, doesn't. Exactly. Does it? Um, yeah, it's because it's not used the enriching expression, isn't it? That kind of works though. Just doing the bang bang on the formula and the data, and then yeah, you looks can like see. They had an, yeah, another expression call there. It seems to me that that's the answer. Um, also, it's important to note, like, you know, as I said at the beginning, if you use the curly brackets, you can kind of avoid this. Sorry, you don't necessarily have to do the, um, it seems that you don't necessarily have to do the, uh, do the, in, in, uh, sorry, enriching expression. I don't quite really understand how that works because I've not seen any much in the way of examples of that. Did, did so is that, I've been wondering about that, the curly brackets. So could you just like, omit the NX for formula and omit the bang bang and just do formula in curly brackets and it'll automatically take it and substitute it there? Well, that's the way I understand it, but I haven't done this in practice, so I can't be certain. Whereas this is like the tried and tested formula, isn't it? Mm. Um, like the double curly braces? Yeah, that's it's like new yeah. to Arling. I mm. believe that's specific to um, like the tidyverse verbs. So like the curly curly gets parsed as meaning capture and then evaluate like expert plus bang bang. Um, so like here it's getting, if you replaced formula in the LM function, I don't know if LM would parse the curly curly formula as meaning the same thing as curly curly would mean in like d plier verbs I'm not sure mm. so what would it do if you did that or like I'm what sure. how would you use curly brackets like what is a simple use case oh like in d plier verbs that's like straightforwardly true it just works like skipping the n expert step plus the bing bing step um so, so if you were doing like deep layer select and you just like had user specified variables coming in as an mm -hmm. argument, you could put those in with curly brackets and it would automatically like expand them yep. for the deep layer verb. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, but unsure if that behavior holds in like other non Arling using options. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that okay. makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. There are a few other things that we didn't cover as well. Um, so there's also the what's it the dot equals sign. Um, uh, I believe that that evaluates from the left rather than from the right. Um, and there's also the enriched symbol, or, or the, I call it enriched symbol, um, en sim. Uh, but I'm not really sure what that is. Um, so what it says in the cheat sheet here, which uh, uh, Garrett. Um, uh, uh, Garrett Gorman uh, uh, put up is it says um, it captures um, uh, the user's argument that will be quoted with the R with Arlang. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it just kind of like an expert makes a symbol of a character input from a function. So if they like specified a like data frame variable as a character, 
then you could immediately turn it into a symbol within sim. My understanding was in sim is kind of like in po, except in po can take expressions and in sim is more limited because it can only take like names, I think. Oh yeah, that's right. So that's it's right. like safer if you want the user input to be if you're always going to interpret the user input to be like a name and not something that's just like evaluated as an expression. Okay. Cool. Does it oh. have to be character? Or can it be unquoted name? I think it's character or a symbol. Oh, okay. Symbol. Interesting. Let me double check this. It's like, I think I found this in the documentation. Oh, it's, oh, I think it's just three. Oh, no, it can be both. Yeah, it can be both character mm. or no quotes. So this is, let me Interesting. Copy paste. The, that would kind of make sense because that's kind of how the across right works here. now in dplyr is you can use names or you can use like a character vector. Yeah, basically like what it says here, um, in sim and in sims provide additional type checking, which is why I kind of take it as like, it's like in quo and in quotes, but it's just more limited. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that it supplies their usernames. Um, and if you look at like the sim, sim inputs, it takes a bonjour coded or, or like in quotes, but it just interprets that as a symbol. Um, so it can take both oh, that's hello very cool. and quote bonjour as like a character. Um, and if you throw that's in an handy. expression, like say hello, um, it refuses to evaluate it. It's just like, that's not something that can be interpreted as like a name. I can bind something to. So I'm just going to error. Cool. Thank you for that clarification. That's useful. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Also found this a uh, pretty good answer on stack overflow about the double curly braces. Um, yeah, it's pretty useful. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, like June was saying, it goes, can be inserted easily into as deep into deep layer verbs without having to do the NX burr bang bang. Mm. Makes it a little simpler. But I guess limited to deep layer verbs. Cool. It is cool. Um, I, I feel like I'm just starting to get my head around it, but um, still quite far off. If you watch the Dan uh, Daniel uh, Chen video, he basically says that he uh, read the um, what's it called the metaprogramming section of Advanced Star for about a year in order to understand it, and I, I see entirely where he's coming from. Totally. Totally. Yeah, yeah I remember back, encountering. Go for it. Sorry. I was just saying, I'm definitely going back to meta programming a few times after we are done with the book. Because <laughs> there's like the thing is, I don't really use it. So, but once I start using it, then I guess that's where you, you get the grasp of it, of it. Instead of just reading and trying to make sense out of it, it's like, how do I use it? Or what do I use it for? Yeah, I mean, I guess it 
it really only comes into use when you're either writing functions for yourself in the future or you're writing functions for other people using R because that's when it becomes really useful. I definitely encountered it three years ago and was just like, huh? And made some really convoluted implementations of it. And having come back across it a third time now, it's making a lot more sense. It's certainly the case of uh, like just going over it multiple times just seems to be the only way to like plug your way through it it's a bit like when you're learning um first learning about certain elements in statistics um like you know, yeah. what, what is a distribution like it seems like a really simple thing now but in the past it used to be like, like why does everything have to be gaussian um <laughs> <laughs> well it doesn't if you uh if you'd like to take a bayesian approach which everyone does um but um you know, why does something have to be Gaussian? Well, you, you kind of need to understand something as fundamental as a distribution curve. And as soon as you do understand why that's important, it makes so much sense. But without actually having that, um, that little bit of experience and enough time to really absorb it, it just doesn't work. I actually used to skip stats classes to, um, at university to go home, to stay at home and read a book instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel that's the same kind of thing here um uh, it's just it's just so new um in a way in a way of thinking and you know when people say talk about you know mental models this is probably the i mean as the way how people are talking about it it seems to be like the key mental model to really help your programming skills take the next level um i actually um what, like I said, I was watching um, Business Science um, the other day, they're one of their uh, streams. And Matt Dencho basically said, you know, it's key to being, a, being good at functional programming. Um, oh. is to understand uh, this meta programming and Arlang. And so, you know, I'm hoping to get a bit more practice with that. But again, it's, you know, we talked about contrived examples. Well, the problem is, is that with these kind of things, they're quite complicated and you need good, you need good examples to work from. But, you know, I don't think Hadley's going to be able to write that in a book, is he? I guess that's where yeah. the problem lies. Yeah, the most recent way in which it was helpful was in that WebSocket thing that I was talking about a couple of weeks ago was like, I wanted to be able to allow a user to pass in stuff from their environment that was then executed each time a item came over the WebSocket. But the initialize, like when you initialize a WebSocket, nothing really happens there. It just creates the connection. And so the user's specifying what they want to happen at that point. But when they actually need to execute the thing when a random you know, you don't know when the function, the message is going to come in and the function needs to be executed. So it's got to get passed down with the original environment that the user was declaring their variables in all the way down to the message handler function. And so that was, I went back and jumped ahead to this chapter and I was like, this has got to be it. It's got to be in code and then it's got to be stored and recalled down inside the R6 object in the message handler and it worked. Like that was what needed to happen to pass that info from the user all the way down into the message handler. <clears throat> and so there's certain places where it will, it'll just, you'll be like, oh yeah, this is where this is gonna make sense to use this. Yeah, I guess basically subfunctions. If you're starting to work in terms of subfunctions and like breaking larger computational things into lots of subfunctions to be able to pass expressions and things down through to other functions, it's useful for that. Is that really common in web scraping? Mm, I, I haven't used it in combination with web scraping, but 
I suppose you could. I, was just I just did about, some web scraping last night. I was just thinking, um, <laughs> uh, what's it? A uh, bit selfish here. My boss basically asked me the other day, what do you think about bringing um, uh, weather data into, um, into our modeling system? <laughs> And um, uh, my immediate thought is that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> but, <laughs> Do you have yeah. good like government, like in the US weather data is really easy because the government, we have so much weather data. Do you have that in the UK? We do, but it's kind of like run by different groups and some mm -hmm. of them let you freely access it and others don't like for instance, weather.com. I think uh, Apple like to use them on their phones, but we've got the Met Office, which do have some stuff for free. But the question is, is like how much of it is there and how much do you want to use? So you have to like link into these databases and pull the data out in uh, the right structure one. And that's why, you know, I was thinking, oh, well, maybe our Lang might be useful there. Um, yeah. yeah. I did some web scraping for, uh... Uh, weather data. And it was uh, from a server at Cornell University. But the only thing is that I did using web scraping because they you had to pay to get like a book, the dating book. So by way of web scraping, I just straight it uh, to load certain page, then wait for like five seconds and then parse the data on the screen into a table. And so it does that automatically. So <laughs> it's like you were doing it manually, but then you can you can do it for like hundreds of stations without mm -hmm. you actually doing it. Because otherwise you have to pay them for a license to download the data. And so that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> no, but it's it's not it's not too hard. Like believe me, like once it's you not. figure out like what are the arguments, it's just like a drop down thing. You just you just have to trick them. <laughs> Believe that it's a human <laughs> doing the clicking here and there. They know oh, yeah, we yeah. do this. They know we do huh? this, you know. And yeah, it's like, know. You know, provide a free API. <laughs> we'll use that rather than scraping your website. I honestly think I got banned on my old Facebook account because I was using Web Scraper on Facebook. I think they figured it out because of the activity. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, like the systematic this user is clicking exactly on this update <laughs> like over and over and over again um i was wondering about are you guys using like a headless browser or are you using like a or docker and running it in a docker i use docker but i'm wondering if there are other ways to do it without docker i did use the r selenium that you talked about a uh, while back yeah so, did you did you were you able to do that without Docker? Yeah, without Docker. Oh. Huh. Interesting. I need to look back into it. I guess they've added functionality because back when I first started using our Selenium, like you had to download Docker, install Docker Toolbox, start an image, and I load the 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 like Chrome debug or whatever browser you were going to use into the Docker. And then you could start navigating with that. I did have to install oh, uh, Firefox on my computer. So, oh. for example, if I start the server thing, it opens a, a window. So I can see it doing things, but I don't have to do it manually. If can that's you what you mean. It? like, Does it have yeah. like a, you can see what it's doing? Yeah. So, wow. I, I, so for example, something I used to do is like, uh, I have like a, in my YouTube channel, which no one sees, uh, I have like five subscribers. So I started to fake in views. And so I had a <laughs> small package. <laughs> so I had a window, like the stream all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to game the YouTube algorithm. That's really funny. Because yeah, you need like four thousand hours before you start making money, and like of course, like uh, one hundred subscribers, I think. <laughs> so I think I made like one thousand hours. <laughs> it's so funny! Oh my god! Oh, yeah. So here's my code. Uh, you need to keep very mind. 
So then you need very different uh, IP addresses in order to game uh, game that kind of system. No, 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 no. Oh wow, they really don't even have that kind of low level. They, I mean, they do restrict. Uh, I think three hundred and fifty views per day or something. But then I had the loop, mm. like all my videos. <laughs> <laughs> at well, some point I had like 200% <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. awesome what's your channel so we can drive membership <laughs> that's right. just look my name on YouTube Okay. You see, we'll look it's it up. just train stuff because I'm obsessed we'll all about build scrapers we'll run you up like 350 a day from all of us <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, awesome oh. Um, so, um, before we all go today, uh, I just wanted to like briefly touch on something because the book's coming to an end soon. Um, now, Stephen and Roberto and I doing um, the, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Tidy Models, which is looking like it's going to be pretty good. Um, by the way, just a note on that. Um, you know how I mentioned on uh, Sunday that I might split the chapter up? I'm not sure about mm -hmm. that. I think it's just it looked bigger to me compared to the other chapters, but actually it's not really as big as uh, some of the advanced R pages, nor as complicated. I mean, it's complex, right. but it's not as complicated. Um, yeah. So I might just do that in one go on Sunday. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> the point Fine. is, um, there's also um, someone asking on one of the channels about doing uh, introduction to statistical learning and I was thinking well the ours finishes in five weeks but Trevor Hasty and Rob uh, Tribbiani is that right? Tib Shirani. How do you pronounce that? Tib Shirani. Tib Shirani who both are absolute legends um, uh, like if you haven't done their course uh, um, uh, Massachusetts uh, sorry uh, is it MIT or Stanford no Stanford they, it's free online the course, the tutoring, but they're bringing out the, the second edition. And I, what I would really like to do, and I was wondering if anyone else wants to do it, is to do a book club on that book afterwards. It's an intro to statistical learning. We're it like is. two. Yeah, but yeah. they haven't brought it out yet. It comes out in summer. And I mean, I don't know when the United States summer is. I imagine it's the same time as uh, the UK, because um, same hemisphere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would be what, July, August. But I think the person who wants to start it wants to start it a bit sooner. But I've already done the course and I want to really wait for the new book in case they use, say, like Tidyverse or any new methods in it. Um, and plus, they're also adding in some new, really cool new stuff about deep neural networks. So I think it'd be worth waiting mm. a little bit. But I do think there's just one to look out for once we've finished this uh, advanced star class. Well, book, 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 book club? Yeah, book club. Why don't you just DM us? I'd be down to do it. Oh, I just thought I'd mention it. It's already been DM, DM'd in the, the book request channel. Um, book request channel? Okay. Are you I planning do on doing it with that cohort? Like whenever they start or you like want to wait and form our own cohort? I think I'll, I'm happy to wait um, because I'm happy to wait for the next edition of the book. And I think it'd be great yeah. to do it with uh, everyone here, but uh, because we're all on reasonably the same timings. And also because Karen also has a PhD in statistics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have read the book. Well, read it. I had a class on it, so I don't really. I'm not want to read textbooks usually um mm. but i think it's a great book um but i'll so well you can just present every chapter right <laughs> well, but here's the best do you part. know where they posted like what's gonna oh here we go second edition adds deep learning survival multiple testing naive bayes and generalized linear models bayesian additive regression trees and matrix completion so it's quite a bit more, to be honest. Yeah, like maybe some more background, like GLM, is, I guess, would be more of a background thing. But it, I mean, yeah. if we're doing a tidy models thing at the moment, anyway, it would probably coincide neatly with the end of that. 
Hopeful. Hope so. Um, <clears throat> Um, but if anyone else is interested in doing any other books after this, just to keep going, anything that's short or something, that'd be cool too. Um, but yeah, uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning, would love to do that. And I think that it's always good to like refresh our uh, math skills because as much as I do love, uh, well, I say love, I love hate learning about uh, statistical coding. I do actually really love to learn about statistics and also know, knowing about the like notation and how it works is you know really really helpful when you're trying to work through different problems y'all will probably learn a lot from like explaining it to me like i'm five because that's what y'all are going to be doing <laughs> if you're doing it with me <laughs> well th this is the other thing that's a benefit they've already done a course which is free available online so you can watch all the videos on youtube i should probably do that stanford university but um so they go over each chapter they don't really go over the book itself so it's not like a book club which kind of encourages you to read the book they do go over it and explain it really well really well plus they also do the lab sections as well it's, mm, just, okay. it's incredibly well taught i think it's one of the best it's also on coursera now not sure if they uh, so I just it. search like introduction to statistical learning yeah yeah absolutely if you want to get a head start on it yeah, go, go, but, um, they have like their own website for it Stanley, cool. Um, Thank you. I don't remember. Do you know what year this book, the first edition, came out? Uh, oh, uh, it's downstairs. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I, it's not that old, but then yeah. it's quite old in terms of the new R world. Yeah, I'm wondering if they will update it or not, because I feel like in stats i don't know it's harder to i don't know well trevor hasty is also one of the main writers of r isn't he um oh, I think so. he? yeah he is one of the founders so so they probably yeah. prefer base yeah wow well i mean get along with base it would be fun to like, base. do the labs in the more up-to-date way yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Oh, that, let's they didn't do that. even let's like do use that. like that, like GG plot. I don't remember. Like something like base plotting. Mm. I I also think that if because obviously you know we're a group of data scientists as well that you know we can take what we learn and because they've already created a lot of materials for us anyway. You can take that information and then just apply it to real world problems as opposed to just the examples that they're using which could be quite nice mm -hmm. um yeah well i will check out that i'm gonna have to check out our selenium too because if there's an easier way to do this without having to use docker and like be in c viewer that sounds a whole lot easier than the like cumbersome setup that i currently have yeah, I sent a link there uh, to a small repo I have, and it might help. Okay, I'm going to start that and take a look at that. Um, sorry, I just found out the original first published uh, statistical learning, Elements of Statistical Learning, which is the uh, older version, which is a bit more yeah. complex, is 2001, whereas... Um, uh, yeah, and there's a second edition with 2009. So I imagine this was written around about the same time. I'm looking at the first page. Uh, 2013. Oh, yeah, 2013. There we go. So that's seven years old. That's quite, well, almost eight. It's quite significant considering yeah. the changes that have happened since 2013. I mean, everything yeah. used to be in base. Now it's virtually all in, you know, pipe through deep, you know, uh, Mitiga. Yeah, deaf, worth waiting. Good to see y'all. Yeah, you too. Yeah, take care. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Hope y'all have a good Monday you or too. Tuesday. I guess some of y'all are pretty much on Tuesday now. <laughs> yeah, stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye.